You're listening to Get to Know World of Warships, a podcast created by Bogsy and Simpax. Okay, everybody, here we are. I'm being joined right now by MF Jones representing 07 Devastating Strike. I'm being joined by Absolute Detonation uh, representing Absolute Penetration. I got that right, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought for a second there that maybe I screwed it up. And I've got Fryce representing SCCC, the Seal Cub Clubbing Club, right? Correct. You said it correctly. Well done. Jesus. All right. <laughs> okay. So these fine gentlemen represent uh, the represent three of the top four finishers. Uh, one, three, and four from North America's King of the Sea tournament. Unfortunately, we do not have Gaishu this time around. Uh, he was a little busy this week, and I just didn't want to wait until next week to put out the episode. I wanted to do it while people are still thinking about Cots. Um, so, sorry, Gaishu. Next time. Um, all right. So. First question. Here we go. Uh, I want to just real quick talk uh, to MF Jones from 07, the winners of the tournament. Uh, I want to talk to you guys first about if you found that there were any ships this season that surprised you, that maybe you thought were trash or you thought uh, were great, that turned out to be the opposite. I wouldn't really say there was a huge surprise. I mean, we knew Small M was going to be strong. Petro was going to be strong. I would say I thought Goliath might have been a little bit stronger than it was. Uh, we did run that a little bit earlier on. But it just felt like Nesky was better all around. But yeah, I, I wouldn't really say that there were ships that overperformed or underperformed. Uh, we, re most people at this level know what you're going to get with these ships. Right, right. So most of the things to you felt like they were pretty much on par with what you expected? Yeah, totally. Okay, very good. Detonation, how about you? Um, yeah. We, we I mean, we use Glias out of nowhere, and it works for us. But other than that, uh, everything goes with the plan. Everything felt pretty much like uh, like you guys kind of expected? Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Fryce? Unfortunately for conversation, I'm going to have to agree with both of these gentlemen. <laughs> I mean, once you're playing at this level you know what everything's capable of and you know you, nothing comes as a surprise really I, I will say Nevsky maybe was a little startling just how frequently people seem to use it mm -hmm. like just alone with a, something else on a flank because there are other ships that arguably do that role better but at the same time if you look at it it offers utility better than the other cruisers that could fulfill that role like a venezia right so what you guys are saying is maybe i should have written a better question then <laughs> I, I i can definitely agree with what he's saying there the nevsky definitely proved to be like just the swiss army knife sure the ships this season yeah well so let me yeah. let me put this out there let's just pretend for a second pretend that i'm a complete potato uh, we don't need to go to my stats to confirm that. Let's just pretend, you know, a little fantasy here. And, uh, like, explain to me why it is someone might want to take the Nevsky over, say, a Venezia or, I mean, even a Goliath. I saw you guys running that a little bit early on, Jones, and I was sort of puzzled just because I don't really know what a Goliath does, you know, better or worse. So can uh, can you can we start with Fryce this time and just give me your impression of the Nevsky and, uh, you know, why, it sort of, why you think it sort of became a go-to ship? Sure. So the, the big thing with the Nevsky is, is the guns are really 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 solid at just continuous dpm and when you combine that with the fact that they have laser arcs every six seconds and a 12 kilometer radar you know it's fairly effective at basically just telling any destroyer that's pushing it hey you just don't get to push here because you push into that bow on if you stumble into the radar you know you're gonna lose 4k in your turnout if it's a competent player and Given that this is Kotz, the Nevsky's almost always going to have a destroyer screening for it. Mm -hmm. So you're going to lose, you know, 8 to 10 because the destroyer is also going to light up on you. And so that requires basically, um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to Jones uh, real quick, but uh, so basically, <clears throat> if I understand it, essentially the, the Nevsky does a role that the Venezia can't, which is as long as there's a destroyer in front of it, the, destroyers, the destroyer screens uh, catches the opponent, oppo opposing destroyer, sorry, and then also has the ability to radar of its own, which the Venezia just can't do. Yeah, like like ships that can do individual tasks better, like the Goliath 
the survivability is just off the chart. Right. But the Nevsky does everything pretty well. And then, like you said, like Fry said, if you have a destroyer screening for it, like you can smoke that Nevsky up, and that's a 12 kilometer no go zone right. for anything trying to push up that flank. That's a really so, good point, yeah. Whereas the uh, the Venezia, I think everybody's afraid of the Venezia from uh, two seasons of clan battles ago where, you know, it just has these huge broadsides of damage against a destroyer, but I suppose it doesn't really have the ability to, uh, you know, I suppose it doesn't really have that same ability to, I guess, the utility that the Nevsky provides, even if it does yeah. have a heavier throw weight at a destroyer. So well, quick, quick cut in there as yeah, well sure. with the with the sap angle nerf that they did. They um, they nerfed the deck pen ability of Venezia, so it's actually significantly weaker at stuff pushing into it than it used to be, because oh, you're not real. arming on like Stalingrad or Moskva or battleship decks as frequently anymore. That's good to know. I don't Versus have the wherewithal. Versus HE with Nevsky, which pen superstructure and sets fires, which I would hope everyone knows just what fires can do. Right. Detonation, yeah. do you found do you, do you find the same thing about the Nevsky? Actually, we didn't use as much Nevsky as these guys did. Um, you go with one big reason is for us, one big reason is Nevsky is is heavily reliant on uh, DD spotting. Right. Um unlike Venezia, you can well, you can kind of spot by yourself and we are not going to use like nine Venezias anyway. But Nevsky, like, since RDD, like, I'm going to use KV, if you remember, KV yeah, as um, right? uh, my team member. Yeah, KV2, uh, he, he played DD. He summers ate, like, nine dwarfs in a single day on cards. So we can, we just cannot rely on DD spotting. I Therefore, see. we are not using as much Nevsky as you know, other, other teams. Sure. So you guys basically sort of went, hey, this may work for other teams, but it's not going to work for us, so we're going to adjust a little bit. Yeah, so that, yeah we pick um, Petro and uh, starting over Nevsky. Sure. That's, that's the reason. Sure, fair enough. Actually, that's a perfect segue to let's talk about the Petro Pavlovsk real, real quick here because um, in the discussions that I've been a part of, after the end of COTS, the Petro has been the thing on most people's minds. Um, I personally, having cast a whole bunch of the games, I didn't see the Petro quite... It didn't feel as dominant to me as people seem to... Uh, I mean, people seem to be thrown around. So, uh, Detonation, I'll start with you. Can you give me your impression of the Petro going into COTS and then uh, coming out, please? Um, my feeling to Petro is... You can do a lot of things with it because because of the spotting range. The consumer is so good that sometimes you can use it as a DD, especially on the one line or ten line, when there's not that much focus fire. Um, the the firing, well, how do you put this? The dispersion is terrible <laughs> on long range. I mean, it's super good, like nine kilometers, but you go over sixteen, it's like terrible. It's no Stalingrad, um, is what you're saying. It's yeah, it's not so yeah, it's not like that. But yeah. So, so what did you find? What did you find? I mean, the strongest thing about the Petro was it was it really tied to the? Uh, for anybody listening who doesn't know, um, the Petro currently and this there's a nerf coming. The Petro has an 11.7 maximum um, or minimum detect range. range. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it has a 12 kilometer radar. So much like the Smallland, that means that if you get spotted. Uh, and you have 11.7 concealment, you can effectively see whatever is spotting you by hitting your radar, which is a big deal, especially in, in competitive like we saw. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and pivot to uh, Fryce this time and say, you know, what do you think is the... What do you think was the effect of the Petro in this tournament? Do you feel like it actually forced a lineup change sort of the way that Stalingrads have always done in the past? So... SCCC played against Petros in one match because we banned Petro and Stalingrad in every single other match. That's right. <laughs> the, the one match where we did not ban them was our game five versus AP yeah. on Loop because Loop is probably one of the worst maps for the style of play that SCCC tends to favor. And we were just trying to shake it up by being able to bring Petros. And what it came down to for us is 
the survivability that it has is too significant when you combine it with the firing platform that it has. Mm -hmm. And just the overall role of the ship, per se. Because you can, you can basically send two Petros to any flank, and it's going to take four ships to kill them in any reasonable amount of time. So you're saying essentially that the tankiness of it, basically the armor scheme and the ability to soak up damage, just meant that it was too valuable not to ban, at least for you guys is what I'm hearing, right? Yeah, because we, we play heavy cap contest style, where we're just going to fight you for the caps the whole time, mm -hmm. and less so over positioning or HP. So when you start throwing ships that can basically sit right next to a cap for the whole game with a 12-kilometer radar in the match, right. it gets complicated. Sure. Um, well, so then I'm going to move on to the champs now. I guess two years in a row champs uh, represented by MF Jones. And I'm curious, Jones, to know if... Uh, I'm kind of curious how much of an effect do you feel like the Petro had for 07 in this tournament? Because, And I'm going to preface this by saying that um, I have always regarded uh, 07, and I hear lots of other folks say this as well, that 07 team uh, tends to be the most precise, the most calculated competitive team out there, which probably has a lot to do with you guys' you know, consecutive successes. How much of a, an effect do you feel like the Petro had this time around? Well, I... I bullshit. Uh... Like Fry said, the survivability, like the profile of the ship just means it doesn't really take damage unless, you know, you're, you're a complete potato and go broadside to somebody. I mean, it's just not going to eat damage. And the firing arcs, uh, the guns and the 360 turrets, the concealment, the radar is just, it's way too strong of a platform right now. Um <clears throat> We probably didn't utilize it as much. Uh, like, you saw a lot of EU teams and even a lot of NA teams when it wasn't banned just go Petro heavy. And it's just, <laughs> like, it's really hard to fight. Like, it's really hard to fight against. Like, you literally don't need DDs at that point. Right. Right. Uh, well, that's fair enough. Um, so I'm kind of curious now because you guys are brilliant about leading me into the next questions that I have prepared. So God bless the three of you. Um, I want to talk real quick. I know that uh, we're all NA folks here, but um, there was a lot of talk after the tournament was over uh, while EU was still going on about the fact that EU, COTS, does not do ship bans. Uh, and we did, in fact, see a whole bunch of lineups that were basically Petra Pavlovsk. So uh, I want to start with Freist this time, if that's okay. And uh, I, want to, I want to hear from each of you as why you think, I mean, why you think it matters. Uh, to have ship bands, or I guess, suppose, do you think it's a good idea to have ship bands, and why? You started with me last time. Start with Jones this time. All right, fine, Jones. What do you think? Ship bands, good idea? It's a hundred percent a good idea because <laughs> it adds, it just adds versatility to the game. Like, it, like if you have a team that you know, like, O seven is known to have uh, really good battleship players on our roster. So, like, are are you going to let us run an all Stalingrad team? Almost every team bans Stalingrad against us because they don't want to let that happen. Right. And we have to work around it. So it, it forces counterplay and it opens up ship comps and tactics that wouldn't ne necessarily be utilized because of meta ships and meta comps. Sure. Detonation, would you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, if you remember, we used Yu Yang only because Smarlin was banned like most yes. of the time. Yes, you guys were the Yu Yang comp. That was amazing. Radar yeah. Yu Yang is yeah. a good ship. Yeah, yeah, and I don't. I think we are the only one using Yu Yang, right? Uh, we brought it for one match. Okay, okay, <laughs> but like it's definitely minority. Yeah, it's uh for those again for those who don't know the uh, Yu Yang got nerfed a couple. I mean, not even a couple patches ago. It was probably like. A year ago, at way this point. back, yeah, yeah, year um, and change, yeah, and a half, probably. It could be, yeah, it could. I feel like it happened right, like about six months into my own World of Warships career, which is about two years ago, so probably around then. The Yu Yang got heavily, heavily nerfed, and uh, essentially sort of became the ugly duckling of the tier ten destroyers. And I feel like when people see the Smallin nowadays, and they see the ability to take radar, 
uh, with no smoke, I feel like it sort of made people go, oh, maybe this isn't the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. So it was fun seeing that in, in COTS for sure. Uh, Fryce, for you, I mean, like, what do you what do you really think that ship bands does for a tournament? Ship so ship bands let individual teams curtail their opponents and their own strategies to what they are better against. So, for instance, when we played KSC and then KSX in uh, the round of sixteen and then quarterfinals, we heavy heavy used Des Moines and Salem's against KSC for the first four matches mm -hmm. where we won three to one and then the first match against KSX we did Des Moines and Salem as well to startling effect and then they banned Des Moines and Salem for I think two of the next three which really forced us to make a counter adjustment mm -hmm. so the the adjustments that it can force mid-event just adds a whole nother dynamic to being able to adapt on the fly yeah. as well as you know, preventing, oh, we're just going to bring five Petros and everyone's just going to push in in a spread out line. And, you know, <laughs> sure. if this ship is misangled by two degrees, he's dead. Right. And do you feel like, I mean, I, I I did see the list of the most banned ships that was put out by the COTS people. And uh, I feel like, I feel like Stalingrad and Petro were the most banned ships. I wish I still had that on me, but um, it would have been really interesting to see how EU would have fared. And how things would have looked if they had instituted a uh, a ship ban. So let's hope they consider that for next time. But um, <clears throat> um, let me see here. Uh, I'm curious to know, and uh, we'll start with detonation this time. Was there anything you guys found? Uh, well, actually, you know what this <laughs> this question sounds a lot like the first question I asked. So maybe maybe I won't do that to you guys. I'm not sure. I, I want to talk specifically about. Uh, two destroyers now because I felt like the actual destroyer choices sometimes made the biggest difference in terms of uh, how teams had to react to each other. Now you mentioned the Yu Yang. You guys brought a Yu Yang with radar at one point uh, because the small end got banned. I feel like the small yeah. end was, uh, it's brand new to COTS because it wasn't around last season and uh, it was a really exciting for a caster at least, it was a very exciting ship to have because it doesn't have any smoke it does have that radar, it's got silly torps, yeah. it's got Daka Daka guns, and it's got a heel, which means it sticks around longer. So I'm sort of curious to know, uh, from the position of AP, did the uh, did the small end do what you guys thought it was going to do? Did you like it? Did you end up hating it? Well, we liked it until we faced Skyfree. <laughs> oh, why is that? I mean, that? it's a good ship, but Skyfree's small end, well, yeah, our small end is on, like, level 1. Skyfree's small end is, like, on level 10. Like, he, his small end is different. And um, yeah, and for us, the DD choices are not as um, viable as some other teams. So when we face Gaishu, we literally ban Smarland and ban Maslo, because he uses it a lot. He certainly then he put a clever, but yeah, well, that's so that's the problem. What is there is a lot of variation. What did you guys find worked best for you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one actually worked best for you? Yeah, for some reason. I don't know why, but it works. All right, fair enough, brother. Fryce, how about you guys in S C? What what uh what destroyer did you feel like fit your playstyle best and why? And not you specifically, but S C. Yeah. So I'm one of the two primary destroyer players in the clan, the other's fuzzballs. Um is if you watched any games where we were allowed to play small and you might have noticed we kind of abused people with it because small is kind of a disgusting ship you can do a lot of things with it and it's comfortably the best cap contesting destroyer in the game just raw combination of the heel you know six six point one concealment seven five radar and the forty percent speed boost that lets you instantly juke basically any shot that's fired at you just it lets you basically out trade any destroyer on a cap forever right as long as you're not bad so we definitely enjoyed small and when small and got banned we tended to alternate to daring for that cap contesting role and then any like kiting flank destroyer role or holding flank was typically a somers just because of the flexibility that usn smoke and the torps provide sure yeah now why talk to me real quick about daring why the daring why was the daring your second choice uh, it's just a really good knife fighting platform. 
So you you combine you know the seven short charge smokes that let you decline engagements with single fire torps with a heal. It's slow, but you have really good gun power and DPM against destroyers. So it it's just probably the second best cap contesting destroyer outside of Smallland, which frequently got banned against us. Yes. That's it too. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> then, uh, Jones, I'll ask you the same question about which DD did uh, 07, I guess, which which did you guys prefer? Which did you like seeing? Uh, which which one did you like coming up against the least as well, if you don't mind adding on to that? Uh, coming up against the least is probably the daring, just because on a lot of maps there are linchpin cruisers. And the ability for those DDs to single fire torps into those positions is super, super bad for us most times, right? So, <clears throat> sure. um, <laughs> I there I saw many a poor Moscow go down on Crash Zone Alpha to those. To yeah, those it's torps. just tough because you you can't leave the island because you're spotted and yeah. Um, but Smallin is definitely a super strong DD for comp. I mean, the cap contention, uh, the guns, the heal, like these guys alluded to before. Um, in 07, we definitely put a lot of strain on our DD players. We ask them to do a whole lot for us. So um, <clears throat> they, I usually give them free reign to pick whatever they think is best for that situation. So, I mean, you saw us play Shima, Smallin, Daring, yeah. Marceau. Um, so, yeah. It, it really all depends on the role you want that DD to do. Like on a kiting flank, a Shima or a Summers is really the go-to. Right. Well, then, real quick, uh, one question from each for each of you. Uh, I'll start with Jones since that's where we ended. Um, the real surprise to me was the Marceau because I ahead of time I and I think I embarrassed myself several times by saying I don't on, like on the casts. I don't understand what the Marceau does that the Clebert doesn't do better except have AA which obviously in COTS is irrelevant because there's no carriers. I found out of course the uh, Marceau has fantastic DPM so uh, real quick if each one of you just sort of wants to like let me know your opinion on the Marceau and whether you guys think it's an actual it's an actual contender I suppose for for a COTS strategy. Uh, Jones can we start with you? Uh, it's just the speed really I mean I believe they go pretty much the same speed but like you said the dpm on the mars so if you can get it into a cap get a cap or even two like send it to the middle quick cap and then go off to an off flank and quick cap that and then park it behind an island or something if it when they have to push into the camp cap i mean it just sits there and murders whatever's pushing in right price much what jones was saying it the speed of it, the the whole of so the whole of Marceau is the same hole as Clever, so they go the same speed, they have the same turning circle, they have the same weird saturation mechanic, which while they display, you know, twenty five thousand whatever health, they actually have about forty thousand effective HP just because of the saturation. But at, at the end of the day, a Marceau or Clever can almost function as a cruiser slash island clear ship. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you have, say, an isolated, you know, Des Moines or Moscow or Petro or whatever on an island, and the opposing team can get one of the French destroyers there, that French destroyer can rush around that corner and kill that ship almost every time with success at the skill levels we see up in COTS. Sure. So the, just the sheer amount of flexibility that the speed and, minute, like, just the speed and everything about the ships allow, just really valuable. Right. Right, right. But they're not great at cap contesting, mm. and that's they're partly getting due to their early. Uh, lack of support uh, abilities and uh, high detectability, right? Correct. Gotcha. Uh, Detonation. You guys ran up against guys who's Clabera, or sorry, not Clabera, Marceau a number of times. How do you feel about the Marceau? Is it a competitive ship? Yeah, it definitely is. It's more like you when you pick Marceau, you just focus more on killing the enemy DD fast and. Like before they're even, uh, before the cruisers getting the, <laughs> the position to shoot you, you're already gone. Right. The speed, the strength, and the five power is, yeah, the god, god, what god muscle to this place. Sure. 
Okay, well, I have a couple more questions for you guys, and then I'll let you get out of here. Um, the last, the last like, ship-oriented question is going to be regarding the battleships. We talked about cruisers, we talked a little bit about DDs, now I want to talk about the battleships. Um, to preface this question, I will say that the most common battleships picked that I saw in the higher level, let's just say round of 32 and above, were the Ohio, the uh, Thunderer, and the Kremlin. Um, now, the commonality there is that each one of these ships has the 457 millimeter guns, the 18 inch guns, but that don't overmatch 32 millimeter bows the way the Yamato or the Shikishima does. So um, I'd like to know sort of how your clan, each one of your clans came to choose which battleship they were going to take. And if, again, if you took a Montana or, you know, I don't know, what, whatever, you took a Shikishima or a Yamato, let us know why. And uh, we'll start with Detonation. All right, so I picked uh, Yamato most of the time because mm -hmm. I'm a Yamato main. And I basically just play Yamato my whole life. That's me. That's your thing, and, huh? Uh, yeah, that's my thing. Okay. And 460 guns, they do horrible things to any ship that sits around. So if you're bowing, you put your nose up into me and you just sit there and I'm just going to do like 12K per salvo into your nose. That's that's Yamato. And I feel like that's very helpful for us to contest, a, well, anything. Sure. If you, if you chose to sit around. So you wanted that, uh, you wanted that bow overmatch ability for the most part with the yeah. 460s. Okay, fair enough. Bryce, how about you? Um, so for the most part, we ran a Ohio and a Thunderer. And you bring the Ohio because it's the Montana hull, so it's got good staying power. The guns are fantastic, and it's just it's flexible at the end of the day. We were bringing a Thunderer mostly to counter really any stationary ships or other battleships, because stationary ships that are you know nose in, you can punish them with the AP on the Thunderer with 30 millimeter overmatch which is more relevant on cruisers than 32, mm -hmm. or you can load HE and do disgusting things with Thunder HE landing, <laughs> you know, 20k salvos a pop on battleships right. while setting a fire to every salvo. Right. So, uh, by the way, what Frank just mentioned there is that the, uh, the, real, the real specific thing about the 457mm guns uh, that they do that, you know, 406s, 420s don't, um, is that they can overmatch 30 millimeters of armor, which is sort of, you might not think it's a common threshold, but a lot of the cruisers at Tier 10 that are not super cruisers, uh, such as, you know, a Stalingrad or, or what have you, um, they have 30 millimeter casemates. And that means that the 457s will overmatch and go right in and have a much better chance of uh, citadeling, doing full damage, what have you. So um, that's, I think that's what, that's what Fryce meant by the 30 millimeter threshold he was talking about. Um, and Jones, 07, as you said before, 07 is known for having some of the absolute best battleship mains in the game. What did they choose to bring and why? Well, obviously, the boys love their Montana. and <laughs> <laughs> Home of the 28-kilometer dev strike, right? Yeah, they just love the survivability, right, and the 12 shells. Uh, like you said, it doesn't overmatch, but we really work on... Uh, setting up really good crossfire between our two BBs so and pushing out things and forcing them to do things they may not want to do to give one of those battleships the nice juicy broadside they need to make those shots sure yeah. um and with like ohio uh pq just loves to sit and shatter and secondary other battleships so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Ohio guns and hull are really good, but I mean, it, if you have the survivability to put a battleship like that near a cap that you have radar overlap over, I mean, literally nothing can go in there. Absolutely. Unless you team up and, you know, YOLO them or something. Right. So, okay. You mentioned the Ohio's with secondaries. Now, we saw quite a bit of this throughout the tournament, and I was delightfully surprised to see it every time I did. So, I mean, did you guys legit think that the, that uh, Ohio with secondary build, was that, I mean, was it worth it to uh, to give up some of the fire prevention and, uh, I guess, survivability that comes along with uh, taking secondaries? I don't know how deep 
some of them went into it but i mean like on, on maps where you can hug an island and shoot secondaries over it like shatter absolutely sure so i i, I do know potato quality 07's ohio um his build was aft for the range manual secondaries yeah. for and manual then secondaries then and then fire prevention yeah some right. survivability because I think it was a you're shooting effectively the whole time in an ohio anyway right especially yeah. with the way 07 plays it so there's you know there's no reason to have concealment based skills yeah detonation did anybody take uh, a secondary ohio from ap ever yeah that will have a <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's, it's helpful <laughs> i mean yeah if you go in with somebody and your ohio is playing solo you're basically having one ohio shooting in at the at the pen and as well as a lander shooting at the home so yeah that's fantastic. That's and, and and the secondaries are just so yeah. accurate. That's yes. the that's the thing with it is if you're on the map like Tears of the Desert and you you know you have to sail a battleship into the middle to just force the crossfire and force contest the cap, a destroyer that's you know half health or so can't really YOLO it successfully. Right. Because they, the secondaries uh, will just tear your face off. It's the it's yeah. the Ohio, the Georgia, and the Massachusetts secondaries, right? Is there does the uh, does the Monty have the same secondaries? No. 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 Okay, so it's it's exclusive, at least, that accuracy buff is exclusive to those three. Okay. Accuracy, um, reload, and range buff. Yeah, and they have good fire chances on their 127s, too, right? 9%. That's they pretty do. damn good. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, See, like, what, what, I, oh, yeah, go ahead, Absolutely. Yo, I, I, I would add something else mm -hmm. to the Yamato pick that I that I chose. Because um, we... AP chose uh, Yamato for another reason, is to killing enemy bb um uh as we see when we play in uh, s triple c the ohio i think it was the land of fire the ohio got yes, it was triple citadel by me 24 kilometers away oh wow yeah. and yeah and ohio just basically can't do anything for the next five minutes right just because he need to heal up and that's uh 460 due to b to enemy bb they can just force you out of position where your BB is not effective to our uh, to surprise our um, uh, cruisers when they when they are doing something right. to your to your team or to control uh, to, to to maintain map control. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just just to expand on that. Sure. In in COTS and in competitive in general, there's there's kind of three archetypes of play. There's the HP, like we're just there's the HP win, there's the position win, and then there's the cap win. So what we noticed with AP at the end there was AP almost always just played for sheer HP win and basically just reversed everybody in and made us fight them. And the pushing ships almost always will lose a fight like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas versus 07, they tend to play for positions. And then we played for cap control. So there's it's all counter moves and counter play. And there's a real synergy you have to find there. Yeah. And that was part of why we struggled so much against AP in those first two games, if anyone watched them. Because, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, we got our we got smashed out of the water in the first two because we <laughs> did not adapt from yeah. the style of play required to beat 07 right. to the style of play needed to play AP. Uh, by the way, I want to interject for just a second to remind everybody that uh, we'll, we'll be wrapped up here within about seven or eight minutes. But um, at the end of this, I will have a link in the description of the podcast to um, to two channels. One is uh, my YouTube channel where every match that I cast, uh, which was I, I cast matches as many as I could throughout the entire tournament, I have cut them all up so that you can watch them in their entirety uh, on my YouTube channel. And I'll also include a link to Sea Raptor's channel because Sea Raptor tended to cast opposite games from me. Um, he's not here right now, uh, so you're welcome, Sea Raptor. But <laughs> I'll plug him and I'll make sure that I add a link to the playlist that he made on YouTube of all the games that he cast. Um, and I will find uh, I will find somebody who put up videos of S Triple C versus AP to decide number three and four, decide the runner-ups. Um, so that if you want to see any of these matches, to hear what these gentlemen are talking about and see some extraordinarily high-level play, you can go there and um, watch any or all of them. Uh, so. Before we get done here, folks, because I don't want to keep you too long, uh, I want to see if you guys uh, have any exciting or embarrassing moments for, that you recall that I call them butt clenchers or back sweaters that uh, oh, no. 
they just give a, a real visceral reaction. Um, and I'll start with uh, AP's absolute detonation, if that's all right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the first game you cast our game, uh, AP versus RNG. Yeah. My eighty thousand Kremlin get ran by eight thousand starting, and we lost the game. Yes, I I recall I recall exactly where you I think you may have uh you may have overextended it's a chatter. tiny bit thinking you could finish the Stalingrad yeah. and a five thousand HP Stalingrad rammed your eighty thousand yeah, HP it, Kremlin. That was beautiful. It. It was, yeah. And another thing is the time management, because the, uh, the the top uh, top 16 game, um, it's also AP versus RNG for us, and um, the first game, I just, I, I was sleeping. I, I, didn't, I didn't get up. You were sleeping? And, and, yeah, I was sleeping. I, I didn't get up in time. And Posky gave me like thirty calls, and I just totally ignored them. Oh, that's right! You literally, you literally were sleeping. You didn't get up, and you missed the game, right? Yeah, I missed the game. No, no, I, I don't mean to digress here, but like, I think I caught something from you when you and I were talking before, and that's that Polsky is stuck in China, right? Ah, uh, he is. But he's not yeah. supposed to be, right? Well, yeah, he's he's he just got a um, he just got a. A PhD program, mm -hmm. but he's not able to make it back. <laughs> Was he playing from yeah. China? Yeah, he is playing for China. So if he, if you saw, he ate a torp or something because he's playing under 130 ping. That's <laughs> you why. can blame the ping. Copy that. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. That's wonderful. I, I didn't realize. I remember you telling me that you sort of offhandedly mentioned, "Oh yeah, our, our clan leader is stuck in China," but. Uh, he did. I did, it didn't even occur to me COVID. that he was probably playing from China during the tournament. That's amazing. He is. And it's like 3 o'clock in the morning oh, for man. him. That's gross. Well, <laughs> kudos to that man. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be sure to tease him about it next time I see him. Uh, Price, how about you and SCCC? Were there any highlight moments you want to you wanna talk about? Yeah, there was, I believe it was versus KSX on Northern Waters. There was a game where it was, I believe, 940 points for us to, like, 990-something that KSX had. Mm -hmm. And we traded four ships in the last about minute and a half, like, between the two of us. Yeah. And at one point it was, I think, 998 to 998, and then two KSX ships died right at the yeah. end for us to win. And every single person was clenching so hard. Yeah. And at the end, you could feel the sigh of relief from everybody. Because <laughs> you know, it was so tight the whole time at the end there. Yeah. And it was just... <sighs> now, forgive me if I get this wrong, um, but at the, last, at the last Worship Masters Invitational, the first Worship Masters Invitational put on by Gaishu and friends, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, was it you versus TNG who played the first game and tied? Yes. Okay, so that was yes. you guys. Yes. That was that was me specifically, actually. So this is almost Who, this was almost I was the rooster a repeat. that sailed into the cap. This was almost tie. a repeat yes. of that. Well, wow. so again, everybody who didn't who didn't know what I'm talking about, uh, in Geistu's tournament, World uh, Worship's Masters Invitational, the very first game played was between uh, TNG and for those who don't know, KSX is essentially a uh, a team from TNG that decided to uh, move over to KSC and they became KSX. So basically, we almost saw a repeat of the same guys, the same two groups of guys who actually tied a game at the beginning of the Worship Masters Invitationals, nearly made Gaishu and Flamu have a heart attack, almost did it again in COTS this time. That's astounding. Oh, I'm going to go back and watch that. Don't, um, don't underestimate the tie. I guess not. Uh, Jones, Champions, 07. This is two in a row for you guys. Were there any moments where you guys either you know, nearly crap the bed for yourselves or uh, or something amazing happened, something that deserves to be regarded as heroic? Uh, well, a couple of the guys, including BFK, will kill me if I don't correct you. We're actually back to back to back. And Wait, chance. three in a row? Yes. I am the They've worst. 11, 10, 9, 7, and 5. Five. I'm and back to back to back. I wish there was somebody but... who was my boss so they could fire me. But anyways, uh, there is definitely a bunk a butt clincher for us in the first round against Peds. Like they definitely put a lot of work into preparing for us and won the first game. And in the second game, if PQ didn't land that clutch shot with 
10 seconds left in the game clock, he <laughs> might not have won that game. Oh, man. I'm going to so, come back and watch that one, too. And personally, for me, against Gashu, there, or Gashu, or however <laughs> <Gashu. you're> sorry, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Gashu. I mean, I've known Gashu for a long time, so he's going to sure, hate yeah. me for butchering his name. Um, but for me, against them, there is a point in Crash Zone Alpha where I had to try to keep Doyle alive in my Nevsky and push him out of the B cap with radar because he was Marceau trying to get into a position to Marceau our Mosfa down. And as soon as I came into radar, I got spotted and I couldn't stay bow in because the Yamato up north would have had broadsides on me the entire time. So I had to turn south, and as soon as I turned south, I saw the thunder shot me. And I really needed a change of pants after that, but <laughs> luckily I slowed down, and the dispersion helped me immensely, and the shells bracketed me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the sort of but stuff yeah, you see. But yeah, that was uh, definitely, yeah. for me personally, that was, that was definitely a moment where I was like, I think I'm dead, guys. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, gentlemen, that... That just about wraps it up here. I have one final question for each of you that should go quick. Um, but before I do, I want to uh, thank all three of you for uh, coming and chatting with me real quick. This uh, You guys represent, along with Gaishu, of course, and his clan who couldn't be here, you guys uh, you know, represent the absolute best of the bets this time in COTS. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to each one of you. I appreciate you lending and sharing some of your insights. Uh, it's always nice to help the rest of the community up their game. Um, so the final question I have, and I'll start with uh, a detonation this time. Uh, Fryce, I feel like I haven't started with you in a long time, so I'm going to start with you. I take it back. Um, is there anything you'd like to see changed, anything different for the next season of COTS to make it better? Um, yeah, map pool. I would, I would love to never have to see Shatter or Loop ever again. Now, when you say map pool, you don't mean map bands. You mean like... A no, I mean the maps that are available to play. Shatter okay. is the most boring map in the game to play, and right. Loop is such a spawn RNG-based fight that it's hardly hardly enjoyable, to be honest. Because what can end up happening is is there's a there's an island on the one line or ten line. I think it's the one line. One that line. Basically, wins or loses you the game, mm -hmm. and if the ships that you want to send there spawn on the right side of the map you win i see provided the enemies spawn on the left side of the map well to and inter first. interject into there I, I agree with the map pool too but yeah. we should get player like sh ship spawns like we should be able to choose yeah, where our ship spawns oh. that would be immensely help that, that would also too. be fantastic uh, you... but going back into the map pool i mean we do it for seating i i wouldn't be opposed to having like a map pool committee just going over maps that are more balanced and just better to watch really hmm. gameplay wise who do you think should be a part of that map pool Ocean. <laughs> ocean is the only map without I, a spawn I, bias. I, I love Ocean. Ocean <laughs> is so... I it in, yeah. in Supremacy League, I picked it first every every yeah. time. Yep. So I would definitely good. say Ocean. Ocean, though, two brothers. These two maps are interesting. Oh, my God. Okay, well, no, I, I... <laughs> What were you going to say, Jones? Go ahead. Well, I, I definitely think there, there could be something to that, to have a committee look at maps and I, I don't know how they do it now but maybe they do that already but I the know. map pool could this definitely time it was oh EU chose this map pool we'll just use that map pool oh okay well fair enough detonation what about you is there anything you'd like to see changed in the future I was a game mode what, sorry, besides what? domination oh a new game uh, other, mode. other game mode yeah oh, what, what kind like, arm race arms race yeah buddy I don't know about all that. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm with Joe and Tier. Uh, for the most part, I think the the tournaments are really well tuned, and the, like it is ha having no CV in them. The only thing like I've always preached for since the beginning is more players. I want to see twelve v twelves and fifteen oh, I versus see. fifteen. That's interesting. But the maps don't really lend to that. Like a lot of them are just way too small to do that True. in. True. A coordinated competitive game. Mm -hmm. 
That's interesting. I mean, what do you guys, just because that's a really interesting idea, detonation, like, for example, let's start with you. I mean, do you think that, shit, this was, this was 9v9, right? Yeah. I'm an idiot. I watched, I watched like, I watched like 50 games of COTS and called them on. I can't remember how many ships were on each side. Uh, I mean, yeah. what do you think 9v9 does versus 7v7 or let's just say 12v12? Do you think, uh, do you think 9 is just generally the correct amount? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Nine and I gave you more margin of error. Cause seven versus seven, like if one of your ships die like in the beginning of the game, you basically lose. Like you there's the chance of you winning back is so small. Versus nine versus nine, there's a lot a larger chances you can fight even though you're one ship down. Right. Would you two gentlemen agree with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's basically what it does is the nine lets you have more flexibility when things don't go to plan because right. all of a sudden you don't have to have one ship alone on each cap yeah. you can have you know three go to one four go to another yeah and then someone goes to the middle later on or one of the edges later on but oh somebody on the side with three you know eight three torps and died right at the start you're not completely screwed because now it's not just one ship there. You still have others. Right. I definitely uh, agree mm -hmm. with that. But like going back to like the reason I I'd, I'd want more players is just I love having more moving parts, more things to do, more angles to have, and it. Mm -hmm. It's more just, complicated to cast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. not you not just more your triple. It, it's just <laughs> stop lying. It, sorry. You want PQ. William and Doyle all reversed in in battleships across the whole map, <laughs> cross firing the whole time. Don't lie to us. I, uh, you, you know what I mean though. Like it, it just like the more pieces you have on the board, it, it, it's like chess, and uh, like I feel ships is a lot like chess because you have to think plenty of moves of ahead because if you Ooh. make the wrong move five steps ago, you're dead. Like, you're already dead. There's nothing you can do about it, especially in a battleship. Right. Well, gentlemen, I know that uh, I've said a million times this is the last question I'll ask, uh, and it was. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to wrap up and say thank you to uh, Freist from SCCC, Absolute Detonation from AP, uh, MF Jones representing the three-time back-to-back-to-back Kots Champions 07, and also congratulations to Gaishu and friends. Congratulations to Gaishu and friends, even though they couldn't be here. Um, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you for having us. And uh, down in the bottom, anyone, uh, any one of these fellows who would like to have a link to uh, their server's Discord put up, I will include it. Anyone who doesn't, you'll know because there won't be there. And I will include uh, some links to playlists where you can see some of these games. Uh, beyond that, I appreciate you all listening, and we'll see you next time.